is said and done, I'm owning it all. I know you think it's just rap, just this, just that. <laughs> right, nah, baby, this my life. Wanna have fun for a night? Then just. Worldwide to infinity. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome um, to our, our final session for uh, the 2021 International Association of Black Actuaries annual meeting. Look, we have had an amazing time filled with some great express sessions, some great general sessions, and I'm so excited uh, to be able to be here uh, to close you out uh, with some amazing information. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. I want this to be interactive. So please, the chat is wide open. The Q&A box is wide open. Uh, we want to get the interaction uh, to ensure that we have a great and wonderful time. So first, chat, task number one, everybody type in the chat box where you are logging in from. I see Cleveland, Ohio's in the house. Of course, Atlanta, Georgia's here. Westford, uh, West Hartford, Connecticut's in the house. Come on, uh, everybody jump into the thing and we're going to get this party started. <laughs> All right, just want to get the presentation up. And we're rocking and we're rolling. And when you're chatting in the box, make sure that you chat to all um, attendees and, and individuals so that way we can know exactly where you're, uh, where, where you're, where you're dialing in from. Uh, but I see the chat box is going. <laughs> uh, it's blowing up. I love it. I see Charlotte. I see Atlanta. I see Council Bluffs, Iowa. Uh, so we have folks from all over the all over the nation, all over the world, and I'm so excited once again to be that be with you all. So, um, as I said, it's a different world. Uh, we're going to talk about some coast post COVID strategies to win inside and outside of the office. But, so let me show you a little something to get this party started. Wow. 
Gotcha. Um, so I know that uh, the music is a little bit soft, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to just show you quickly um, the intro uh, to one of the shows uh, that was a huge, huge um, impact on my life, my collegiate career, et cetera. I was in early elementary school when that actually came out. It's called A Different World. And for those of you that are not familiar with A Different World, it's definitely one of the best shows. I love it. It was a show that talked about college life at a historically black college or university, a made up school um, called Hillman, which is like a combination of probably Hampton, Howard, Morehouse, Spelman, all that kind of stuff all together. And it was absolutely phenomenal. It was a great show. And I love the, the theme of it because it talks about it being a different world, meaning that wherever you came from, when you went off to college, um, you know, it really uh, was a different world. You know, people were different. Um, the way you thought was ultimately different. The ways that, 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 that you had to interact with individuals were, were different. And the reason that I brought that up for today is because as we know about 18 months ago, everything on the entire planet became different. And uh, I'm going, and that is what today is all about. Um, talking about some strategies, not only to get through, because we're kind of still in the pandemic, but trying to hopefully come out of it. But so we're in this weird in-between place. Uh, but I want to give you some skills um, that I've learned from working with a lot of different organizations um, and individuals over the last, I guess, 18 months or so um, to really set them up to succeed um, both inside and outside of their professions. And uh, I'm so excited to be able to share this information with you, with you all today. So as you can see, uh, I think you guys have gotten to know me over the course of the last 10 years. And for those of you uh, that I'm brand new to, uh, once again, I'm Chris Cooper, um, number one best-selling author, executive and peak performance coach, uh, speaker trainer, author, all that kind of good stuff. And um, of course, a what I consider to be a lifestyle and procrastination expert. And thanks so much for the amazing feedback on the uh, anti-procrastination session. I know I crammed a lot into that express session, uh, but today we have more time. Um, so let's flow with it. So, um, as I said, that's always important, I think, for everyone to know exactly. I learned two important lessons in life. No one hears you until they know you. And number two, no one cares what you know until they understand how much you care. So I want to break this down to you. And I want to, you know, of course, I'm coming from a place of service. I love this organization. Uh, I, I wear my honorary actuarial hat uh, well because I'm not an actuary. <laughs> uh, but I'm so excited. As I said, I look forward to being with you all every year, like almost like a family reunion of sorts. Um, but for those of you that I may be new to, or even those of you that may know me, um, you may not know a lot about my background and, and how I got to this place. And this is very germane to our discussion today, uh, because it's going to tell you why I am uniquely qualified to be able to share this type of advice, given where we are um, right now um, in the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic. Um, as you see, as I said, that in different world had a, had such an impact and profound impact on me. I chose to attend at HBCU as well. Um, I, I attended Morehouse College, um, and I was in a dual degree engineering program. Um, I studied mathematics, much like a lot of you guys, um, and industrial engineering at Georgia Tech. After that, I went on to get an executive uh, MBA um, from the New York University. Um, and focused on leadership and knowledge management and wanting to understand why things were they were in different organizations. I've also had the awesome pleasure and privilege of serving for about four, almost five years as an adjunct instructor, as well as a corporate instructor um, for Emory University and their Center for Lifelong Learning. Um, as you can see, author, media personality, I've been blessed to be on TV and all that kind of stuff. Um, serve clients on five different continents, speaker trainer. Uh, I am a big advocate, advocate for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, actually STEAM as well, the arts as well. Um, a mentor, but my favorite job in the entire world, as you can see, is the biggest thing on there. Uh, I'm a dad, I'm a father, and I have two boys, one that just turned 15 a few days ago, and my youngest is 11. Um, I've had the awesome pleasure and privilege of working consulting for well over, what, 75 plus of the Fortune 100 and 500 companies, thousands of different organizations across the world. Uh, this is just a laundry list of individuals that I've worked for and consulted for, et cetera, just to kind of give you a breath of, of my experience um, and as to why I'm saying what I'm saying today. So I feel like you guys know me, so I'm going to keep rocking and rolling. Um, I do want you to understand this. I know I said this in the previous session, but I want you to understand that this mantra from Zig Ziglar is so powerful to me. And, and I live by it every single day. And it says you will get all you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. And that is what I've dedicated my life to 
um, one of service in which I'm able to pour into individuals much like yourselves today. So let's rock with it. So caution, check this out. I hope that you guys have pen and papers uh, because as I said, I usually run large events and multi-day events and I'm training for hours upon hours, 40 hour weekends where I'm uh, experiences where I'm giving so much information. So guess what? This is going to probably be information overload today, but it's okay because it's being recorded. You can go back to YouTube. You're going to be able to see it, but I want to caution you that you're going to be drinking a little bit from a fire hose, but I want to ensure that I give you everything that I've got today and that we can have an awesome and incredible time and that I'm not skimping. Um, so I'm going to give you everything that I got. Um, so I hope that you all buckle up for a wild ride. So real fast, I just want to see if you guys are with me. I know I'm talking fast and I'm rocking with it. Raise your hand and tell me that you're in if you're in or type it in the chat box. All right. I see the hands going up. All right. Everybody's it. Yes, I love it. I love it. Guess what? This is an interactive presentation that is interactive. Um, so I'm going to be looking for you to, uh, of course, everybody can't talk, but the chat box is wide open. If you have questions along the way, put them in the Q&A. Um, our team is working with me and they're going to be able to filter those questions to me. And I'll stop at different points in the presentation uh, to give you an opportunity to do such things. All right. So let's rock and let's roll with it. So. Um, I know you're like, okay, Chris, this is great and wonderful. And you're trying to give us all this energy and all that kind of stuff. That's great. But what's in it for me? That's the favorite radio station for everyone in the world. Now, I'm going to tell you, um, by the end of our time today, you will learn the three massive mistakes that even smart professionals make that keep them from being virtually visible. Bingo. Guess what? That's one of the biggest things, biggest post-COVID and during COVID skills that you have to have is write that down, being virtually visible. Number two, as a professional of color, you are going to learn exactly what you need to do to maintain your sanity and continue on your path to growth, productivity, guess what? And even promotion in unprecedented times. And the last thing, of course, I'm gonna give you what skills um, that the top 1% of professionals know right now that are essential to post-pandemic productivity and advancement. Um, so it's going to be a wild ride. So I hope that you guys are buckled up and ready. So now, roll call. So it, team, if y'all can get the first poll on the screen, because I have a ton of information and I'm going to cover a lot of different areas, but I want to make sure who do we have actually in the audience. So if everyone will just, the, the first poll is about to pop up on your screens. And, and when it pops up, um, I want you to answer that and just choose whatever area you are. Are you a student? Are you a mid-level professional? Are you et cetera? And I'm going to leave it open just for a few seconds um, for everybody to go ahead and, and, and answer those questions. Are you a career changer, right? You know, uh, choose, choose the one that best represents exactly who you are. Uh, because what I'm going to do is I have information that actually is going to be tailored to each and every one of these categories, but I'm going to be speaking uh, to specific points. But I got to find out who do we have in our virtual room uh, right now. All right. So we'll keep it open for another... 10 seconds or 10 seconds or so. Oh, participation level is up. Come on, y'all. Get me over 80%. There we go. There we go. There we go. All right. So here we go. So we have about 15% of you are actuarial students, 1% career changers, 10% entry-level recent grads, lots of mid-level professionals, 33%, 21% managers, and then uh, also 11% senior level uh, professionals and executives. Excellent. All right, so guess what? I've got something for every single one of you. Um, so let's rock and let's roll with it. Thank you. Now, I wanna talk to you because as we know, literally 18 months ago or so, our entire life transformed. And it was due to what I consider to be somewhat of a perfect storm. We were hit with a global health pandemic, of course, as we know, uh, COVID-19, uh, which literally has lost millions of lives across the planet. We have dealt with civil unrest due to racial inequality and police brutality. Um, of course, in the wake of George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor, and so many other individuals. Um, we also saw an economic downturn, you know, and somewhat of a depression. And then also, to top all of that off, there were natural disasters, wildfires running rapid, hurricanes, climate control issues. So it was a very interesting time to be alive in that 2020-ish um, world. So having said that, this is a day that I will never forget. And I think this date also was a day that many of you 
will never forget, especially all of you guys that are my working professionals. And just out of curiosity, somebody type in the box, what do you think happened on March 19th, 2020? And just somebody put in the chat box, tell me what you think happened on March the 19th, 2020. Come on, talk to me. Oh, y'all just want me to tell you. I see, I see how you do. Not quite George Floyd, not technically, no. Continue, what else? There you go, Shaquilla. That's right, the global shutdown actually started. And what you're gonna see is literally this. Check this out. This is when state to, the state to state stay-at-home orders due to coronavirus went into effect. You see, it began right at, look, look at this. We had only 9,197 cases of COVID on 318. But by 4-7, the U.S. cases were almost at 400,000 individuals infected with this horrible disease. So I want you to look at this. So it started, of course, California was the first one to kind of really shut down. That was 319, but then followed by Illinois and Jersey and New York and Delaware, Indiana, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Mexico. And as you can see, just how all the states begun um, to go into quote unquote shutdown mode. And when the global shutdown mode happened, a lot of things transpired. Uh, transpired. Um, one important thing is I'm really big on research and studies. Um, and this is actually from Deloitte, um, actually my former company, it was my first job out of college. Um, I actually worked for um, Deloitte Consulting. And, and they had this, th this statement uh, that said, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, an estimated 2.7 billion people, or four out of five workers in the global workforce, have been affected by lockdowns and stay-at-home measures. I want you guys to understand what I just said. 2.7 billion people affected by a virus that literally went, that spanned across the globe. And when this happened, it, forces, it forced businesses and governmental leaders to respond quickly and to rethink their workforce strategies in real time. So uh, Deloitte wrote this whole article about this whole concept of being able to respond, recover, and thrive. And I wanted to use that kind of as a backdrop for what we're going to talk about today. If you're going to win throughout the rest of this pandemic, however long God knows how long it's going to last and coming out of it, you're going to be able, you're going to have to be able to respond, recover, and ultimately thrive. Now, I want to get real personal. Um, I, like most of you, um, was affected heavily when this, when, when this happened. For me, as I said, I own a professional services firm. So I do coaching, training, and speaking work. I'm in front of clients. I'm, I'm headlining conferences. I'm doing uh, you know, live workshops and presentations and all that kind of stuff. And literally, when that global shutdown happened, I literally saw hundreds of thousands of dollars just whoosh, evaporate. And I'm being honest, I'm human. So I freaked out a little bit. I had about a pity party for about six days. I'm being honest. <laughs> I had to deal with my own mental health. And I think that's very important for a lot of us. Uh, but, but, but in that process, and, and, and I, like I said, I'm a big man of faith. So of course I was praying to God. I said, okay, you want to tell me what to do? Because I don't get it. I don't understand the whole world is shut down. What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to feed my family, kids in private school? Like all this stuff was just running through my head. And, and, and God dropped in my spirit three R's that became my ultimate pandemic survival kit. And I hope that I can share these, these nuggets with you today. And I hope that it, that it inspires you and helps you to also even think about your own situations, about how we can come out of this and ultimately thrive. And the first R was this. The first thing that I had to do was I had to reflect. And when I say reflect, I really had to go to a place of gratitude. And understand that although things may, quote unquote, appear to be bad, they could ultimately be worse. And when I say reflect, I'm talking about being grateful for, guess what? Reflect on, guess what? Who and what matters most to me? Reflect on my many blessings. I'm going to tell you something right now. I know there's a big conversation around mental health, specifically within our communities. And, and one thing that I know that is very prevalent, we don't talk about it a lot, is depression. And individuals sliding in and out of depression and going through depressed states and even maybe feeling suicidal or, and, or those types of things. And I'm going to tell you, it is much more common than people want to admit, especially within our communities. So one thing that I think that was extremely important was for me to understand that, and I'm going to tell you this, it is biochemically impossible to be grateful and depressed at the same time. 
I'm going to say it again. You cannot be grateful and depressed at the same time because the spirit of gratitude, which I believe is one of the world's most powerful emotions, will overtake you. And in despite everything that's going around, everything that's ultimately happening, you are going to be forced to look at yourself and look at the blessings and the things that happen in your life. So when I say reflect, the first R that I went through was just reflecting on who and what mattered most to me, who and that, you know, what was most important, you know, and guess what? That brought me to the second one. Then I had to refocus my efforts, guess what? On the things that matter and not the things that didn't. Because I'm gonna tell you one thing about the pandemic. It slowed us all down. That spirit of busy, that spirit of always on the go, that spirit of always doing something so that way you can avoid being with yourself. Come on, somebody. I might preach to y'all today, I promise. <laughs> but that spirit of just always going, 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 we had to stop. And guess what? And a lot of us had to stop for a second and take a look at the man or the woman in the mirror. And when we take a look at the man or woman in the mirror, it caused us to basically deal with some things that maybe we didn't want to deal with. It caused us to think about some things that maybe were uncomfortable. So now that you're reflecting on, on what you're grateful for and what matter, who and what matters most, now you're refocusing your efforts on the things that matter. You're not having the frivolous conversations with people that don't even matter. You're not talking to the people that you know that hate that that really hate on you and really don't want to see you succeed. You're, you're, you're taking you're taking that equation out. So therefore, you can focus. Guess what? See, every time you get on the airplane, even now in the pandemic, the first thing they tell you to do is that in case of an emergency, they say, put your oxygen mask on first before you start assisting others. So if this pandemic has taught you anything, it should teach you to reflect and refocus, guess what, on you and what matters most to you and, and align your effort and your energy and your presence in the things that ultimately represent what you want and, and how things happen. Are you guys with me? Raise your hands or give me something in the chat boxes. I feel like I'm going and I want to make sure that you guys are with me. So, yes. All right. Y'all with me. I love it. So the last R, which I think was the most critical for me in my pandemic survival kit, was this idea of reinvention. So after I reflected on who and what matters most to me, after I went to a place of gratitude so I could get out of a state of depression, after I went into this place of refocusing my efforts and putting my efforts and energy and, 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 my, and, and everything toward the things that really matter and the people that really matter, then I had to figure out how do I reinvent myself, right? And guess what? You're looking at the reinvention of Chris Cooper right now, being able to deliver a virtual, an entire virtual conference from the comfort of my office here in my home, right? Being able to provide that same level of energy, enthusiasm, being able to, to, to be able to, you know, to feel questions and to, and to show up and to give you everything that I got, even though I'm not physically in front of you. That reinvention was everything. I had to look at new programming. I had to look at ways that I can deliver my courses and, 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 and my coaching programs and all that. Like, I just, it just caused me to really, guess what? Do a lot of the things that I probably should have been doing before, but wasn't doing. Oh, come on, somebody. I think I told you all yesterday, I am a recovering professional procrastinator. So there were certain things prior to the pandemic that I knew I should have started to do, especially in regards to business expansion and development that I wasn't doing. But guess what? <laughs> I had, you know, be careful what you ask for. Because we ask for time. We say, well, we never, I don't have enough time. God gave you all the time in the world. And what we're going to see coming out of this pandemic is who used their time wisely and who squandered it away. And I'm telling you, everything is going to be in the power of the results. So that's just my um, pandemic survival kit. Uh, but I want to get more into you. Now, um, all the studies have shown, I've done lots of research and stuff, that one of the number one skills that is essential and critically important for everyone going through the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic in order to succeed professionally and even personally is this concept of virtual visibility. Write that down, virtual visibility. Okay, Chris, what does that mean? What does that look like? So let me tell you first what it doesn't look like. <laughs> so I'm gonna begin with this. There are three mistakes that individuals that are smart, right? Smart, great people like yourselves make that keep them from being virtually visible. The first one is this, whether you realize it or not, this is the new normal. We're not going back. So failing to adjust to what is happening, you can't say, oh, I want to go back to the good old days. I want to, I want the office to be the way it used to be. I want, you know, people to act. No, everything has changed. Write this down. The only thing that you can bet on is that things are going to change. I'm going to say it again. The only thing that you can bet on is that things are going to ultimately change. 
And when they change, we must pivot. We must adjust. We must position ourselves in a way um, that that is going to make, you know, that is going to make, uh, you know, some things, you know, some things happen. So having said that, I want to um, talk about what this failing to adjust to the new normal looks like. The new normal, check this out. You have to have dedicated space to work remotely. Now, I know some of you guys have been working remotely for some time and we're well into the pandemic now, but I just wanted to go back to some, some key points. I did a workshop um, during the pandemic on work from home success strategies. And one of them, um, you, know, you know, it's important, um, you know, it, it's important for us to understand that people think they know how to work effectively from home. But are you really being efficient and effective? And is it showing up to your superiors, to your peers, and all the other individuals that you work with? So the first thing is this, this dedicated space to work, right? The problem with this is, guess what? In so many of our homes, there, but our, our, our homes used to be our, 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 our safe haven. It used to be our retreat. It used to be a, a place where, you know, where we found solace and that kind of stuff. And now we've brought this work energy and this work environment, right, into this place. And because we've bought, you know, we, we got kind of have this collision of, 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 of serenity and peace and harmony and all the pressures of work and it's boom, and it's, and it's now compounded. So because of that, you've got to kind of set some boundaries within your home work environment. So that way you understand, hey, when I'm over here, this is work. If you have children, if you have, um, elderly individuals in the home, if you have anybody that's going to bother you, you need to guess what, just like you would do it at work, have somewhat of a sign or something that says, hey, mommy, daddy's working right now. I can't deal with that right now, because it's going to impede your ability to show up and do exactly what you have to do. So dedicated workspace is very important. The next thing you have to show up, you know, every single day, this is not vacation. So you still need to go to work, even though you're home. Did y'all catch that? You even got to go to work. I have one of my clients, he actually, in order to really kind of get himself into the mindset of this, when everything happened, he would literally get in his car, go out the garage, drive around the block, and then drive back home to simulate, to get his mind right, to understand that he is actually going to work. Because I'm telling you, it's a very easy way, you know, when you're sitting in your office and the refrigerator is within reach <laughs> and you always want you want to go eat something, you want to get distracted or that kind of stuff. So you have to put yourself in the mindset of understanding exactly where you are. The next thing, this is one of the biggest lessons I think that we all learned in this new normal, is that you've got to effectively manage expectations. And I'm going to tell you, there's a couple of managing of expectations that we're talking about. Managing expectations of yourself, managing expectations of your manager or your supervisor or your superiors, managing the expectations of those that work for you, managing expectations of your peers. You have to effectively, guess what? And I'm going to jump down here to this thing, over-communicate. You have to over-communicate, over-communicate, over-communicate because they're not seeing you every day. You're not at the water cooler anymore. You're not at those types of places. And I know that a lot of, a lot of individuals, excuse me, are going back to this whole concept of, um, of, a, of, a, of a hybrid of sorts. Um, but even in going to a hybrid of sorts, you want to ensure that you are over-communicating so people understand exactly what's going on. Um, I talked about the ground rules and boundaries. You know, those are now required that you're working from home. Um, you know, I know a lot of the kids are going back to school in person, so that's a little different, but I know that this is a huge struggle for a lot of individuals in the pandemic of trying to manage. I know for me, I was trying to be teacher and work and be on conference calls and take care of the dog, and it was just a lot of priorities just being pulled in multiple different places. And then the other thing is says, don't slack off, you know, because you're still working. So I just wanted to show you, these are just some elements of what this new normal looks like. And I'm telling you, it's not going anywhere. It's going to be here. So the number two mistake, okay, that individuals, you know, that are super smart are making when it comes to being virtually visible is this, lacking the self-discipline and self-governance. Guess what? When you're home, nobody's watching you. <laughs> nobody's watching you. I know that, you know, certain companies may have some, you know, tracking software and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, you are now... And you've been the next last 18 months or so, 100,000% responsible for your own self-discipline and your own self-governance, right? The other thing about this, a lot of companies aren't mad about the, the virtual work environments because guess what? Productivity has actually gone up. People are working more than they even were when they were going to the office. And that's because guess what? No commute time, right? That's because guess what? As I talked about before, there's no delineation. There's no, there's no, there's no division between work and life. 
And now, guess what? We got to be careful because that work-life balance thing is not becoming a, a realization for a lot of people now because you're working all the time. You're getting up in the middle of the night and going to your laptop. You're doing work. Like you, you've, you've got to temper all of that. So when I talk about this self-discipline, this self-governance, it's about being able to, to map out all those types of things. And that's a big reason uh, why individuals are not being virtually visible. And the last one, and I love this, Jim Rohn said this, discipline is the foundation upon which all success is built. Lack of discipline inevitably leads to failure. And I know that we don't want to fail. So, uh, and the number one mistake, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through these quickly because uh, I really want to get your questions and I want to give you some more information, is that they even smart professionals make that keep them from being virtually visible is this, their mindset. Their mindset is off. Let me tell you something. I know I spoke about, uh, I spoke about um, mental health already, but I'm going to tell you that your mindset is everything. Write this down. Success is 80% psychology and only 20% mechanics. I'm going to say it again. Success is 80% psychology and only 20% mechanics. And when I say that, our personal psychology, our mindset is everything. And so when we talk about coming out of COVID, we talk about winning big, it's going to be related to this kind of, this kind of uh, circular action. So our mindset, as you can see, determines our behavior. Our behavior will impact the actions that we take, which can lead to solutions, which can get us results, but then that results will get us to performance, but we need more hard work, right? to kind of keep going back in, to kind of change our attitude, to adjust our behavior. So that way we can get back to action, back to solution, back to results, which will create performance. That performance will lead to our attitude. Attitude will lead to behavior. You see this, it's a constant cyclic process. But if your mindset is not right, everything else is not gonna work. And so if you take anything else from the session today, mindset, mindset, mindset. That is the biggest skill that is gonna be critical for you coming out of this pandemic and being able to succeed you know, beyond everything that we're ultimately going through, all right? All right, so um, are there any questions thus far about anything uh, that I'm saying because I'm about to rock and roll and now I'm gonna really break it down. So I want everybody to really pay attention because I'm gonna give you some specific strategies depending on where you are in your career and those types of things in regards to this whole concept of virtual visibility. Um, so, all right, so I'll see if they pop up and we'll keep rocking with it. So. Let's talk about increasing your virtual visibility. Okay, so for all of you that are individual contributors, right? That means that you don't have a team. That means that you are an individual contributor on your team and that kind of stuff. If you want to increase your virtual visibility, this is what you should be doing. You should number one, be asking for, check this out, not long meetings. People don't wanna meet for a long time, right? <laughs> they wanna meet for short periods of time. You should be looking to ultimately Ask for 15 minute video calls with key individuals, right? Whether it's your manager, whether it's, a, and notice I said video calls. And because guess what? Even though we're virtual, even though all that kind of stuff, people still are lacking and desire for some type of communication. They want to ultimately see you. They want to, they want to engage with you, um, you know, in, 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 in a great and powerful way. Um, so ask for those 15 minute video calls. And I say the 15 minutes, uh, because they're short, sweet, and to the point. It's a great point to check in. It's great to say, hey, this is what I'm working on. This is what I need. Um, and this is, you know, the guidance that, I, that I'm looking for. And also so they can give you some feedback so that way you can move forward. And never forget this. Write this down as well. Feedback is a gift. Feedback is a gift. Even if it's constructive criticism, even if you don't want to hear it, it is a gift, a gift, a gift. And let me tell you, it's going to be a lot more feedback now that we're in this more virtual environment than ever before, because they're not going to be able to interact with you in an in-person format. Um, so they will not be able to see some of the developmental uh, challenges that you may ultimately be having because you're behind the computer screen. Um, the next thing, I say send weekly communications to key leaders and stakeholders. See, don't rely on your manager to, to brag on you or to say exactly what you're doing. If you're managing projects or you're managing initiatives or those, send weekly communications to those key leaders and stakeholders so they're aware of exactly what you're doing. And also to show that, hey, I'm here. Yes, I'm home, but I'm also here. The next thing I encourage you all to do, volunteer for leadership roles in employee resource group, special interest groups, International Association of Black Actuaries, all these places, right? It just gives you the opportunity to be visible and to be around. And it's going to increase your ability to really, you know, progress in your ultimate career. 
Now, I'm talking to the managers and the leaders. I know we have about what, thir roughly 30, 40% of the audience fits into that category. Look, I'm gonna be very clear when I say this. Stop by to check in on your people, not to check up on them. I'm going to say it again. Stop by to check in your on your people, not check on your people. This is very important because when you go to your teams and those that report to you, um, or those, those you're responsible for, and you're taking it from the perspective of, oh, I'm caught, what are you doing? What are you working on? What do you, what, you know, like no one wants that. So check in on them. Hey, ask them, you know, and you don't have to use these words, but you know, hey, how, how's everything at home? How's everything going with, you know, with your personal life? How's everything going here? Do you feel like you have some challenges? Is there any way that I can ultimately help you, right? That's checking in. That's not checking on. Like when's it, when, this is the due date. Where's the project? Where are we? Like, guys, we've got to be more human and more relational than we've ever been before due to these actual physical boundaries. I hope you guys really understand that. I hope you really get that. I'm talking to the management. I'm talking to the leaders. It's so critically important. The next thing, um, I've been working with a lot of executive leaders and I, I encourage them to do this. Host ask me sessions. Sessions that you set up with your team could be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, where you just give them, they can ask you any question they want to ask you, whether it's about work, whether it's about personal development, whatever it is, give them an opportunity to feel like you care, right? And to feel a true connection with you, even though you are geographically dispersed and not with that person every day. And let me tell you something else. These things are great for virtual visibility, but they're also for in-person as well. So when you do get back to the office, still continue to do some of these same types of things. You'll be amazed at how you'll be able to grow your team, make some awesome and incredible things happen. The next thing, managers and leaders, focus on empathy and also on connection. Empathize with your people. Connect with them. I'm not saying give people excuses. I'm not saying let people off the easy way. What I'm saying is that show individuals that you give a damn about them, right? And their development and everything else. All of these things matter because I'm going to tell you, people don't lose, understand, look, whether you realize it or not, I know we're still kind of in the economic downturn, but things are beginning to pick up. But right now it is definitely an employee's market. A lot of individuals are leaving jobs. They're looking for opportunities. You know, we talked about in the market trends um, at the beginning of this conference that this is a great time if you're looking to move into another position. People are looking for you, especially those mid-career level individuals. So understanding that you have to give individuals a reason to want to stay on your team, to stay in your organization, to stay on board so that way you can do some awesome and incredible things for them, all right? So I know I had a question right here and it says, uh, what do people mean when they say having a growth mindset? That is an amazing question. So a growth mindset simply means this. It means that you are, guess what? You are open, right? It means that you're curious. It means that you're inquisitive. It means that you want to become better. That's what a growth uh, mindset um, you know, ultimately means. And, and it will enable you and it will, put, it will present you with an opportunity to guess what? You should always want to do these three things. I'm write these down. You should always want to be want to be able to learn. You should always want to be able to grow and you should always want to be challenged consistently. So when you talk about a growth mindset, it's the ability to learn, to grow and to be challenged consistently and to embrace, guess what? That challenge and to embrace that opportunity. Um, so, um, the next question was the ask me sessions. What if your org is really quiet? Um, my team meetings are so quiet and lack interaction. So guess what? Somebody has to be the hell raiser. Somebody has to start it up. So guess what? This is a great opportunity for you to step up and show something different. Guess what? It's going to work now because nobody else is doing it. So this is the perfect opportunity in your organization if it's really quiet, right? Because guess what? Um, a lot of, and I'm going to be very blunt and, 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 and honest, a lot of the, um, the, the, the behavior toward diversity and inclusion and equity um, is beginning to fizz a little bit. It was the hot thing. Everybody wanted to put out a statement after George Floyd. Everybody wanted to do that kind of stuff last summer. But are these organizations and are these individuals following up on what they say they're going to do? And that is where we, as professionals of color overall, have to hold the majority accountable to the things that they promised and the things that they said they're going to do. So guess what? That's a perfect opportunity to have an ask me session to say, hey guys, let's talk about what's really happening in the organization. 
Yes, we're a year past George Floyd, but what does that really look like? What does that really mean? You know, where are people emotionally, right? And their emotional health. Where are people, guess what, professionally? You know, people's skills have, have guess what, deteriorated over, over the last 18 months. Things have changed. So how can we make some of those challenge, those changes in order to be more effective and ultimately to be more efficient? Um, so great, great question. So if it's not happening, guess what? If it's up to me, I love this little poem. I said, if, it's, if, it, if it has to be, it's up to me. I choose to see the possibilities. So if nothing's going on in your organization, step up, make it happen. If you feel like you're not in a position where you feel like you have the voice or the cloud or the power to do that, speak to your, uh, speak to your, sub, uh, to your superiors and tell them, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in doing this type of thing. Would you be open to, to hosting a session? I'll gladly help you. I'll assist you because that's going to show you initiative and it's going to help people really do um, some awesome and incredible things. All right. All right, so we keep, y'all, I love this. This is a good session. You guys are rocking and rolling with me and, and I got so much more to, to share with you. So let's rock and roll. All right, so next thing. So I wanna share you share with you um, some pan pandemic proof promotion pathway information for professionals of color and others seeking advancement. All right, now notice I said very specifically for professionals of color. Um, I've had the awesome, uh, I guess, privilege of, like I said, over the last 18 months or so, in the reinvention phase of doing more diversity, inclusion, equity work, as well as um, really coming into employee resource groups and executive teams and helping them transform themselves and really prepare themselves to deal with the challenges that are happening as a result of all of this perfect storm of sorts. And ironically, I was coaching some of the individuals and I didn't realize this, but through the pandemic, there were, this is just three examples, but there were about 15 of my clients and individuals in my groups that I coach and train that all got promoted. Check what I just said. They got promoted in a pandemic. And I, I was like, well, I didn't, that wasn't my goal for them. I don't even think that was the goal for themselves, right? But because of the opportunities that presented themselves, these individuals got promoted. One of them became a senior leader in technology. One was a manager in government and the other was an individual contributor in academia. And now all of them have significantly increased their income, significantly increased their, um, uh, their, their footprint in their respective organizations. And, and, and so guess what I did? I know that success leaves clues. And I know the best way is this. One of the first, first lessons I learned in business is that you got to give people what they ask for, not what I think they need. So I wanted to ask them. So I said, you know what, let me interview these people. Let me ask them exactly what they, you know, what did I help them do or what did they do that allowed them to get promoted even in a pandemic? And every single one of these is as a professional of color. So I wanted to share this information with you all to understand how you can also leverage some of the exact same skills to do some awesome and incredible things. Ah, so now anybody that knows me knows that I am a big, big game show. <laughs> and because I'm a big game show fan, um, I love uh, one of my favorite game shows is The Family Feud. And so I talked to these individuals. Like I said, I interviewed all the ones that I helped get promoted in the last 15, uh, I mean, last, uh, you know, 18 months or so, these 15 individuals. And, and I broke it down and I said, okay, let's hone in on each of the individual skills that you know were, you know, were, were key or influential in you getting promoted and, and having these quote, quote unquote, during and post COVID skills that ultimately, you know, feed your advancement. And so these are the top eight skills and I want to give them to you um, in the format of how we would do on the show. So number eight, self-care. Can you believe it? Self-care was a reason why individuals got promoted during the pandemic. Self-care meaning, guess what? Taking care of their mind, taking care of their body, taking care of all of the things that people say, oh, well, don't worry about that later. Oh, you know, work-life balance, that doesn't exist. All that kind of, no, they took time for self-care. And specifically, guess what? From a mental health perspective, taking breaks, setting boundaries, you know, deciding when they were going to work, setting work hours, exercising, getting outside of the house, right? All of these things were critically important to these individuals getting promoted. The next thing, number seven was courage. Oh, and this was a great one. We talked about this yesterday in the session um, with the leaders, and I believe Sharon talked about this. Um, and, and she talked about this in, in regards to females in particular um, being um, a little more hesitant to go after the promotions, right? Or to go after the opportunities or to go after the things that they desired and they wanted um, for, for lack of fear or, or something like that. So the courage 
is so critically important. The courage, guess what? To stand up for themselves. The courage to get what they want. The courage to ask for the things they want. You know, the Bible talks about it, you know, closed mouth doesn't get fed, right? <laughs> so these individuals had to take a, a stance of courage and stand up and ask for what they desired and what they wanted. Number six, awareness. Ooh, this is a big one. And I know y'all don't want to hear this, but guess what? You know, you have to understand that you are not perfect. <laughs> we all live in the world's biggest room. Ready for it? It's the room for improvement. I know my jokes are really corny, right? <laughs> but we do. So you have to be aware of, guess what? How you're showing up. You have to be aware of what you're doing. You have to be aware of your strengths, of your weaknesses, of your opportunity areas, of all that kind of stuff. You know, that all of these things are critically important as you, as you look at, at, you know, progressing in your respective career. So awareness was really, really big for each of these individuals that got promoted. Number five, relationship building. Um, the session was amazing today from the uh, the Black Leadership Academy. I'm from McKinsey, et cetera. And he talked about mentors and sponsors and coaches and, and, and all these other types of people. And, and it's so important that you learn. And all these individuals, guess what? Even had to build, guess what? Virtual relationships because it's the pandemic, right? You're not in front of people. So you have to learn how to develop these virtual relationships as well. Let's keep rocking and rolling. Number four, ingenuity. They had to come up with new ways. Remember I talked about reinvention was one of my skills that, that was really important to me in my pandemic survival kit. So they have to have ingenuity. They have to be able to think critically and analytically, but at the same time, think outside the box and create new solutions and new ways of doing things. So that was critically important to these individuals winning um, in their professions. Next thing, ownership. Oh, that's right. Guess what? With knowledge comes responsibility. So guess what? You guys are responsible for everything I'm saying today. Even if you don't catch it all, watch the YouTube replay <laughs> so you can have it. But guess what? Now that you're aware, it's so important. I, I said this in the uh, fireside chat with George Nichols the other day, that understand that your mind is like a parachute. Your mind is like a parachute. Once it expands, it never goes back to its original dimension. See, I, I'm a sky well, not I'm a skydiver. I have skydived. I'll say that. <laughs> I don't do it all the time. Uh, but one thing about the parachutes when skydiving is that they can only use a parachute a certain amount of times because every time somebody jumps out of the plane and the parachute opens up, it the material begins to to to, to pull and eventually it pulls out of the out of the required mandated you know um, requirement that makes it unsafe. Right. So understand that taking ownership of yourself, of your career, and, and, and of your mindset, all of that is critically important to really move forward and do some awesome and incredible things in your career. Number two, consistency. See, huh, this is where a lot of people mess up. A lot, a lot of people mess up. You're not consistent. You show up sometimes. You knock the ball out the park on one review, but you don't do it on all of your reviews. Being consistent and letting people understand that you're in the game and you're making it, especially from a superior perspective, is, is so critically important. Consistency, consistency, consistency. So let's look at these real fast. Self-care, courage, awareness, relationship building, ingenuity, ownership, consistency, and the number one skill that all of these individuals use that help them get promoted, help them win, all that kind of stuff is this. Clarity. <laughs> clarity, guys. Guess what? Each of these individuals was clear about what they wanted, why they wanted it, and how they would ultimately get it. It's kind of what I talked about in the Express session yesterday. What they want, why they want it, how to get it. Write that down. Get clear on what you want. Why do you want what you want? And how can you position yourself to do it? So it was a combination of these skills that got all 15 of those individuals some amazing promotions. I think the raises um, were probably just shy of $650,000 between the 15 of them. Um, so it was like, you know, over half a million dollars worth of raises that individuals got um, as, as a result of that. So it's so important. Um, all right. So uh, I know that we have a question about compensation and stuff. I'm going to get to that one. Um, shortly, uh, but I want to rock and roll to make sure that we get all this stuff done. So I, I did see the question. So now, as I said, I know we have a mixed audience. I know that we have our allies in the audience. 
lots of individuals that may not be black actuaries or black professionals at all, um, recruiters, executives, et cetera. I am going to, I can say this because I'm saying this on behalf of Chris Cooper. <laughs> this is not on behalf of the International Association of Black Actuaries, but I think that the executive board and everybody else would agree with me on this. But this is my public service announcement for anybody in the name of allyship. And I want you to understand this. When the rules are clear and the floor is level, Black professionals excel. I'm going to say it again. When the rules are clear and the floor is level, we excel. Check this out, though. Anytime the rules aren't clear and the floor is not level, your organization, our community, and society suffers. What the heck are you talking about, Chris? What I'm saying is this. In the past, prior to the George Floyd movement, prior to all this stuff, Black Lives Matter, prior to all this type of stuff, there have been, and they still are, huge disparities and as well as access to um, conversations, resources, et cetera, of Black professionals versus white professionals. And we've seen it. Um, uh, you know, um, Mr. Mina talked about it in his session uh, about the Black leadership. Um, Academy and what they're doing at McKinsey. There's, there are disparities, guys. The data is there. It's real. It is a real fact. The pay grades are different. The opportunities are different. So I'm just going to say this. I'm going to be emphatic with it. I say this to every organization. Anytime I get in front of some allies and, to represent on behalf of the organization, whether it's an employee resource group or an executive team or a board or a nonprofit, but whatever it is, hire, promote, and support Black professionals. That's it. Point blank, period. Hire, promote, and support Black professionals. If you do this, your organization will win. You will bring diversity on all levels that you, it's not just about them being Black. It's about them having, as we said yesterday, diversity of thought, diversity of experience, diversity of, of ideas, diversity of perspective. All of those things, they don't hinder your organization. They ultimately help your organization. So in the name of allyship, guys, hire, promote, support black professionals. And I know that your presence here today is indicative of your commitment, but your presence is one thing, action is another. So let's make it, so let's put our, put our money where our mouths are. Now, I say to say is that this, this new normal workforce, and, and I put diversity, right? This new normal workforce and this uh, success pipeline, and I put diversity in parentheses because most companies don't have a diversity success pipe pipeline, but I'm talking to the recruiters, I'm talking to the executives, I'm talking to the teams um, out there. I want you to really get this. You have to understand the importance of this. This is the way that you're going to be able to maximize everything that's happening when you talk about increasing diversity and you're making things better and coming out of COVID stronger and all that kind of stuff. It really comes down to these four things, recruiting, engaging, developing, and promoting. Not only recruiting diverse talent, you've got to engage them when you get them. The problem is people are recruiting, 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 and you're not engaging them when they're there. And guess what? They're leaving because they feel alone. They feel, we talked about it in the article yesterday in, in, um, that was written, I believe, on Sharon Robinson um, about being the only one, you know, being a chief actuary, being the only one and, and not having the ability you know, to be around individuals that look like you and not engaging, right? So engagement is so critically important. When you recruit these individuals, which I know you're recruiting, you're hiring from this thing, engage these individuals. The next thing, you have to develop them. You have to develop them. This is a form of development, right? Sessions like this, develop them, give them resources, give them things that they need to be successful in the organization. And then when they've done that, then you promote them. You don't promote them just because they're black. You promote them because they have the skill set. They, they are developed. They, you've engaged them and you recruit the top talent. That is how you create a successful pipeline for workforce, diversity, and just workforce overall, a successful workforce. So uh, I'm gonna keep rocking with it. So now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. Oh, first of all, any other questions about that? Cause I know I'm rocking and I'm rolling and I know I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> all right, any additional questions about that? Okay, so we're gonna jump into that. I know, I know there was a question about um, how to advocate for your increase in pay. Uh, I'm gonna get to that, I promise. Uh, but I wanna get through these skills uh, because we have a lot, a lot to still cover. So like I said, it's a lot of information. Hope that you take it. Now, these are the post-COVID must-have skills for professionals. So guess what? This is germane to recent grads, to students, to middle-level managers, to senior leaders, to everyone. All the studies are showing these are the post-COVID must-have skills for professionals. The first one, as you can see, communication skills, both written and verbal. Guess what? 
This is extremely important because we're in a virtual world. If you're not able to effectively articulate your points via email, via chat, via um, Zoom or whatever it is, communication, communication, communication. The next thing, honesty and integrity. Remember I talked about that self-governance and, and, and self-discipline? You know, all of these things are critically important. These are the skill sets that are critical and necessary for individuals coming out of the pandemic. Teamwork. Guess what? You're in dispersed places now, right? So because you're dispersed, you've got to be able to work effectively, even virtually, with teams. The next thing, motivation and initiative. Let me tell you something. You cannot wait around for somebody to tell you what to do in this workforce right now. You've got to be proactively motivated and show the initiative. You feel like you don't have enough work or you don't know what's going on, go to your manager, go to your superior, find out exactly what's going on, find out how you can get involved, volunteer for things. This is the difference maker. This is where I talked about the consistency. When people see you constantly stepping up, yes, you will get promoted. Yes, you'll be able to effectively ask for that pay increase that you desire and that you ultimately want. But guess what? You can't do it unless you're showing the results. The next thing, strong work ethic. I think that's self-explanatory. The next thing, you're our actuaries, of course. Analytical skills, being able to problem solve. Those are critically important. Of course, computer skills and organizational skills are also really important. Um, whether you realize or not, technical professionals need this a whole lot right now. Technology has definitely changed, and a lot of people may be technical, but are lacking in some other areas, and I'm going to hit you on, on those things in just a second. The next thing, being detail-oriented. Guess what? This is not the time to slack off and not pay attention to the details. They say the devil is in details. Detail, detail, details, 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 details are very, very important. Um, leadership skills, of course, the effectively being able to lead. This whole experience over the last couple of days has all been about positioning you and creating opportunities for you to ultimately lead. You got to have self-confidence as well. If you're not confident in your abilities, how are you going to sell me on your, on, your, on, on your promotion or on your ability to move in this organization or your ability to get the next job or your ability to lead this organization or your ability to be the senior actuary, right? All those things matter. The next thing, uh, friendly outgoing, you know, that's just relationships, right? I know that actuaries are known to be more introverted, but guess what? What if you were the one actuary that was more outgoing and more friendly? Don't you think that you would stand out more? Don't you think more opportunities would open up to you because you were approachable, right? And you're eight and people are able to understand exactly where you're coming from. The next thing being tactful, right? I, I know this is, <laughs> they say common sense is not common, Tactfulness is not common either. And some individuals don't know how to really say or express what they're saying without offending individuals. So being tactful is one of those skills, especially now that I'm not physically in front of you. I can't, you know, I can't tell your tone from an email. I can't tell your tone even from a chat comment, you know, other than you putting it, putting it in caps. <laughs> so it's very important that you understand the importance of having tact and being tactful in your approach. Of course, well-mannered, polite um, for the students. Proven academic as well as a professional record. Guess what? School only teaches me that you're able to show mastery, mastery in a certain area, mastery in a certain subject. Next thing, creativity, entrepreneurial skills, and being a risk taker. That's one thing we say that actuaries sometimes are, you might be firefighters of risk management, but you're risk adverse. So you've got to be able to, if you're going to win coming out of COVID, you've got to be entrepreneurial in your thinking and you've got to, you must, you must, you absolutely must be a, a risk taker. And you got to have a sense of humor. I think I threw that in just for fun, right? So the number one skill, the number one skill when you look at this uh, coming out of COVID is remote proficiency. And once again, it just kind of hits on some of the things I talked about. Virtual communication, being technologically savvy, being self-initiating, and also being able to build relationships even digital, digitally, right? So those are all critically important. So now I know you guys are like, okay, Chris, you talked a whole lot and we need to get down to the nitty gritty. And this is what you've been waiting for. So just be with me. I know we got about another 29 minutes or so, and I promise I'm going to take it home for us. Um, the top 1%, right? What skills do the top 1% of professionals know that are essential to post-pandemic productivity and advancement, all right? It's very simple. It's these two things. It comes down to soft skills and emotional and social intelligence. I'm gonna say it again. Soft skills and emotional and social intelligence. These are the difference makers. 
if you didn't get anything else I said today, which I gave you a lot, these two things will dramatically change the trajectory of your career, your life inside, inside the boardroom, outside the boardroom, inside your career, outside your career, soft skills and emotional intelligence. So let's break this down. So when I talk about soft skills, what am I talking about? I'm talking about skills such as leadership, right? Effective team leadership. I'm talking about change management. Guess what change management means? The only constant I said you can bet on life is that things are going to change. So change management, being able to guess what? As I believe, uh, I keep quoting Sharon, but Sharon said this yesterday too, being able to embrace the change, not just tolerating the change, but embrace the change that's ultimately coming. The next thing, you gotta be effective problem solvers and decision makers. Now, this is a problem. Most of us are not good decision makers. Let's be honest. Most of us are not good decision makers because I'm gonna tell you something. What I've learned is this, from working in, like I said, in coaching and training with the amazing Tony Robbins and being a peak performance elite results coach and all that kind of stuff, is that most of us don't understand the importance of this. If you have one option, guess what, guys? You have no options. If you have one, if, if, they, if there's only one path, you have no paths. <laughs> if you have two options, you have a dilemma. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. It's only when you're presented with three or more opportunities, right? Or or options that you can make an informed decision. Did you catch that? If you get, if you, you know, if, if it's only one, you have no options. If you have two options, you're in a dilemma. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. But when you get to a point where you have three or more options, now you can make an informed decision. Now you can look at what I call the rules of decision making. And I'll share them with you really quickly. The, the, the number one rule of the of important decision making. I know a lot of people need this. Number one rule in decision making is this: you've got to write it down, especially if it's a difficult or a hard situation, you've got to write it down. Number two, rule of decision-making is simply this. You have to know what you want and why you want it. That's the clarity piece again, right? So what, what do I really want? Do I wanna make a decision as to what my next step in my career is? I really wanna make a decision as to what my next step in life is. If I really wanna make a decision, is should I stay at this company, should I leave? So understanding and getting ultimate clarity about what it is. And by writing it down, you're able to effectively see it. The third one is this. Every important or difficult decision you make in life is going to be based on, guess what? Something you, you, you actuaries love, probability. Guess what? I'm very optimistic. I believe that anything is possible, but certain things are more probable. So it's important that when you talk about the decision making, that you look at the probability associated with your particular options, right? The upsides and the downsides of every uh, situation. And the last thing I think is really important when it comes to decision making is this. You have got to understand that all important decision at the end of the day, it comes down to one simple thing. And that thing is value clarification. What do you value? What matters most to you? What's critically important to you at this particular time, right? The next thing, resourcefulness, right? It's not about resources. It's about being resourceful. Whatever you have, you've got to be able to literally, guess what? Position yourself. So therefore, you're able to maximize on the things that you do have access to. A lot of people over, overlook that. Oh, I don't have this or I don't have that. But what do you have? Everything you need, whether you realize or not, is within you now. It's up to you to dig deep and figure out how you can connect the dots and the pieces. The next thing is this, giving and receiving feedback. I said feedback is a gift earlier. Um, Self-confidence, creative thinking. And as I said, this last piece, which is emotional and social intelligence. Let me break that down to you. So what is emotional and social intelligence, Chris? So what it is, it is your ability, right, to guess what? To be self-aware, to manage yourself, to be socially aware, to build good relationships, and to be responsible in your decision-making. So when I talk about emotional intelligence, sometimes they call it EQ or SEQ or ESI and all these other types of things. What I'm talking about is that you've got to be self-aware, socially aware, self-managing, have to be able to build good relationship skills and you have to be responsible in your decision-making. Now, I know I have said a ton <laughs> of stuff and I'm sweating all that kind of great stuff, but I wanted you to really see the full gamut of where we are. And coming out of COVID, these two skills, these, these soft skills and this ability to, to have a very high SEQ, social and emotional intelligence, these are the differentiators. This is what's going to make all the difference when we do get back to some type of quote unquote normality, which is really the new normal, which is completely different than what we did before. But all of these things matter. And I hope that this was helpful thus far in giving you perspective as to what matters and what is ultimately going to help you along the way. So, Chris, 
How do I level up? This is how you level up. This is what I recommend. So if you really want to win coming out of this COVID thing, coming out of this thing, I encourage you, get a coach and a mentor, get a sponsor, all the things we've been talking about. And guess what? And be one too. Executives out there, allies out there, recruiters out there, all that kind of stuff. Get a coach, get a mentor. Guess what? And be one too. And be one for other individuals. The next thing, you've got to be open to learning. You got to be wanting to grow. You got to want to consistently be challenged, like I said earlier. The next thing, you have to be intentional in delivery and execution. You don't just let things happen by happenstance, right? If you want a specific role or going after a specific role, know why exactly what you want and what you plan to do in that particular role. It's not just about the title. It's not, not about the money. It's about the impact that you're going to create when you're in that role. And guess what? Who else can you lift up? Who else can you bring along? You know, we say we lift as we climb, right? It's so critically important. You got to understand, as I said earlier, that feedback is a gift. I know you don't want to hear that stuff sometimes. <laughs> and then also, and I love this one, you got to put a concerted effort toward improving your social and emotional intelligence. Now, I'm going to jump back to the question um, that was here earlier. Um, and I know that question was about, do you have any tips on how to advocate for increase in base pay, both in a current role and in a new role? Ah, such a great question. So let me tell you the one thing. Write this down, documentation, documentation, documentation. I'll give you a very personal example. When I was in corporate America, um, I was very fortunate to get promoted three times in 18 months to become the youngest junior executive with a major telecommunications company. Um, with each promotion and each ring up the ladder, I did get an increase, but I knew my increase was different than my counterparts. And I'm speaking of my non-Black <laughs> counterparts, right? And uh, one of the things that I did was I documented everything. I documented, this was my job description. And I said, and I kept a list of everything that I did that guess what was above and beyond. Cause you know, they had that little line in job description says and other duties as assigned. <laughs> so I wrote down what those other duties as assigned were. And I kept documentation and I put together. So when I went for my last promotion and I wanted to increase, I specifically put together a promotion document. Number one, I looked at everything that, like I guess I looked at that job description. I looked at what they asked me to do. I looked at what I actually did. Guess what? I took the excerpts from what they said about me in my reviews. Chris is one of the top 10% of employees. Chris has saved the company $15 million. Chris has resolved over $144 million worth of issues. Da, 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 da. I, I put their exact language in it. So it was irrefutable. Not what I'm saying about myself. It's what you said about me. But guess what? It's because of all those skills I talked about earlier. I was consistent. I showed initiative. I, I stayed on top of things. I made sure that I always showed up. I made sure that I always knocked the ball out the park, right? All those things were critical. And I put that. Then I did a salary analysis. I went to places like salary.com, right? And glassdoor.com. And I found exactly what individuals with my skill set, my experience, my level of degrees, all that kind of stuff were getting paid. And I saw where the range was and I realized that I was out of the range <laughs> and not out of the range in a good way, out of the range in a bad way. So I made my increase based on what you asked me to do, what I've actually done, what you said that I've ultimately done, what the industry says I should be paid and ultimately what I'm asking for. And when you give in individuals that level of empirical research and access and information, they can't, it's, they can barely say no to you, that they can't say no. And, and they have to be damn good at maneuvering and, and, and using all kinds of jujitsu word shaping and forming <laughs> to talk you out of exactly what it is, right? Now, it may require them going to higher levels to get higher levels of approvals. Like that was my case. What I wanted was above the pay grade of uh, what, what was above the, I guess, the, um, the, the, the granting permissions or power of my immediate uh, vice president. So he had to go to more of the some more C-level type people to get what I wanted. But at the end of the day, that's what you've got to do. So the way you advocate is that you document, you document, you document. You use their words, not against them, but you use their words, you know, to assist you and to help you in that particular area. And then in addition to that, if you're looking for new roles, the same thing. You look at what is required of that person. What is, you know, what are they looking for? What are people in that role constantly being paid? And you want to ensure that you don't, let me tell you something. People think that people leave jobs because of money. Most people don't leave because of money because the average person only gets like a $3,000 increase. And we know after taxes, that's nothing, right? The real reason, real reason that people leave 
jobs is because of the fact that they do not feel valued. They don't feel appreciated. They don't feel that they're seen. They don't feel like they're heard. So when you're seen, heard, appreciated, and that you matter, and that you're making a difference, and you're making an impact, that is how you win. That is how you position yourself. So when you talk about this whole concept of, of being, you know, looking at a new role or, or, or individuals looking for new roles, think about that, especially all you managers and leaders out there, right? Do your people feel heard? Do your people feel that they're being seen? Do your people feel appreciated? And go above and beyond. And sometimes it's not always money, guys. They all remember, guess what? Even fast food chains do employee of the month. Do you know that's something so small? It seems so insignificant, but at the same time, it's so powerful because it shows individuals that you appreciate them and you highlight them. And I'm going to tell you something about recognition. Recognition is so powerful that guess what? Babies cry for it and grown men will die for it. Y'all think about that. <laughs> recognition is so powerful that grown people, literally grown men will die for it and babies will cry for it. So if you position yourself and you make sure that your people understand that they're heard, that they're seen, that they're appreciated and all that kind of stuff, it will change the game forever, I assure you. So I want y'all to stick around because I got an announcement to make, so don't leave. <laughs> we got some more stuff um, to go through. Um, so I know we got a, a few minutes left. Um, so I will open it up for additional questions. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. No more questions. All right, raise your hand if you're still with me. I need to know if people are still out there. Raise your hand, put in the chat box. Okay, so y'all still with me, all right. Raise your hand if you felt like you learned something new today. All right, I see the hands going up, right. Raise your hand if you feel like you were reminded about something you knew. That's what I'm talking about. That's what these sessions are about um, and really positioning yourself. I gave you guys a ton of information and I hope that it, it went across all of the barriers of the executives all the way down to the, uh, you know, to the individuals that are still students. Um, but I want you to really take heart to all the information that I shared. Go back, look at this. It's going to be posted on the YouTube, all that kind of stuff um, as well. Um, I think there may be another question coming through. So great one. How do you overcome imposter syndrome? Oh, that's a big one. And that's a very important one. Now, Imposter syndrome is real. Um, I experienced imposter syndrome, syndrome at a very young age. I was what I first experienced it when I was about 19 years old, um, doing one of my first internships. It was an engineering internship uh, with General Motors. And uh, well, it was actually my second internship. Um, but I was the youngest and darkest person in the room. <laughs> the youngest and the darkest person in the room. And I was responsible for, I was an industrial engineer, so I was responsible for process and performance improvement um, and helping individuals that had probably been doing the job. No, not probably. Definitely were doing the job longer than I had been alive. <laughs> and their attitude was one of such um, that was very um, condescending, like, who is this little kid? How you want to tell me what to do? I also experienced this when I got promoted to become that junior executive, when I was told by one of my employees that she had shoes older than me. <laughs> and so how would I be able to tell her what to do? So one of the things that plays on, on your mind, your psyche when it comes to imposter syndrome is that you feel like you're not enough. You feel like you're not good enough. So one of the things that I had to understand was that I had to really take time to write down all of the reasons why I knew that I was capable, that I was able, and that I was powerful. Understand what I said. I didn't say type them. I didn't say text them. I said write them down because there's something when you take a pen to paper, there's an emotional connection. And I had to write down all the reasons. Look, I had the GPA. I did the interview. I have a proven record of success. And then when you begin to say all of these positive things about yourself, it will help literally get rid of any negative thinking and stinking thinking, as I call it. Let me tell you something. I used to do a lot of work with young people. And studies show that for the average like middle schooler, that for every negative comment that they get, like you're ugly, you're fat, you're dumb, et cetera, it took 22 positive comments to counteract that one negative. Just think about the proportionality right there. 22 times of something powerful and something positive to counteract that one negative thing. The same thing actually happens in your work environments. So that one person that said that you that you suck, that one person that said that you messed up, that one person, you need 22 other comments, right? To say how great and wonderful you are. And you have to start with believing it yourself. So you got to believe in yourself, in your abilities. You earned it. You passed the exam. 
You passed, you know, you did what was required. You interviewed, nobody gave you anything. And one thing that I had to learn, and I wrote this down, I want you to write this down as well, is that I earned my seat at the table and now I'm going to sit at it. I'm gonna say it again. I earned, it was not given to me. I worked my ass off. I busted everything possible to ensure that I could get what I desired and what I ultimately wanted. And I would be damned to see anybody try to take that away from me. And, 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 and I know that I may come across as a confident person, all that kind of stuff or, or whatever. But once again, this is a learned behavior. I had to acknowledge because I had all the shortcomings. You know, I grew up in, in, in North Philadelphia. My mother had when she was 16 years old. My father was not in my life. I went through rejection my whole life, not feeling like I was good enough, not feeling that I was worthy, all these types of things. But I had to guess what? I believe that God literally wired us for success, but society has programmed us to fail. And when I say that, it comes to this imposter syndrome of you're not worthy. Even in business, as I was beginning to get success, I was like, oh, you're a one-hit wonder, Chris. Oh, wait, wait till they find out who you really are. You know, I, all this stuff comes in the back of your mind because society makes you feel like you're not enough. You know, you're, you, guess what? Most of us are looking at, you know, at this particular um, point of understanding that other individuals, you know, are, are posting things on Instagram and all that kind of stuff. And they're showing you the highlights of their lives. They're not showing you the real deal. You're looking at a preview. You're not looking at all the hurt, the, the pain, the stuff behind that, 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 that's going into those perfect pictures, right? And those perfect things that they're ultimately doing. So what I want to say to you all today is that when it comes to imposter syndrome, you got to tell yourself that you're great. One mantra that I write down that I know is so critically important, I hope that you write it down too, is simply this. And it says this, I am worthy and I deserve everything that I desire or what I desire. I am worthy and I deserve what I desire. Write it down. I am worthy and I deserve what I desire. I'm gonna say it one more time. I am worthy and I deserve everything that I desire. Write it down, laminate that card, put on the index card, laminate it, hold it in your pocket. Anytime that stinking thinking, anytime that negative stuff begins to fester in the back of your mind, whip out that card and remind yourself of who you really are. Y'all got me going today, baby. <laughs> Um, all right. So another question about this salary discussion. How do you feel about counter offers? Is this something you consider? Absolutely. You should absolutely. Let me tell you something about work, especially now in this economy. Be willing to stay, but ready to go. Always keep your resume current. I'm going to say it again. Be willing to stay, but ready to go. Always, always, always keep your resume current. So what am I saying, Chris? Chris, what I'm saying is that, yes, take counter offers. You, and especially if you're in an organization that you want to stay at, show them. When I talk about that document that you put together that talks about what you've done and how great you are and what they said, how great you were and what the industry is paying, that is great documentation to put as well. Well, look, I have a counter offer somewhere else that they really want me. Show, and, you, and you require and you mandate that your employer show you how much you're really valued. That's when you'll see where it, when, when, it come, when the rubber will hit the road and you'll see. So absolutely, absolutely take counter offers, interview, find out things. It, it doesn't hurt to look, right? Find out opportunities that are out there. Be willing to stay, but ready to go. Always keep your resume current. Woo, boy, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Any other questions? Because y'all, look, y'all know I can go. <laughs> I can go, I can go, I can go. Okay, so it looks like we may be transitioning. Um, so uh, what I want to do is this. I I'm about to close this thing out, right? I've given you a lot of nuggets. I hope that it was a lot of great information. I hope that it really helps you um, to think about, you know, the importance of social and emotional intelligence, um, um, you know, as well, and as social and emotional intelligence, the importance of soft skills, the importance of being virtually visible, the importance of positioning yourself to get what you want, those skills that help those individuals get promoted. I know I packed a lot of stuff into this particular session, so I hope that you get it. But right now, I am going to prepare because I'm so excited. I, I don't know about y'all. Virtual is awesome, but in person is awesomer. <laughs> yes, I made the word up and it's okay. So I'm going to click my camera off for just one second. And I will be back in just one second because I want to share with you where our next meeting is going to be. And I'm so excited. Yeah, go ahead, throw your, I see Toronto as a guest. Go ahead and start typing your guests in the chat box of where you think our next uh, meeting is going to be. Go ahead, go for it. Bermuda, that would be awesome. I I'm down for that. Bermuda, Toronto. All these great and wonderful places. 
So let's see. Let's see. Come on, y'all. Bring give me some uh some ideas as to where you think our next meeting is going to be. Come on, we want to know. Cleveland, San Francisco, Jamaica, yes, yeah, man. <laughs> Hartford, yes. <laughs> let's go to Connecticut, right? Uh, no, nope, no, nah, they don't want to go to Connecticut, Kate. <laughs> so everyone, it gives me great pleasure to announce where the 2022 International Association of Black Actuaries meeting is going to be when we get a chance to see all your beautiful, amazing, and great faces. We are going to NOLA. We're going to New Orleans. Les les bon temps roule. We are going to have an incredible and, and awesome time in New Orleans. So save the date, save the date. It is going to be August the 11th through the 13th, 2022. Second line at all. I see the who that's out there. I'm representing with the Mardi Gras mask. New Orleans, we are coming. So get ready, y'all. Save the date, save the date, save the date. It is going to be absolutely phenomenal. I can't wait to see you all there. It's going to be an awesome and a great time. So having said that, guys, hey, Hey, we are so excited um, that you joined us uh, for the conference. Uh, what I want to do is I, I want to definitely do this before we get out of here. Uh, quickly, that's my contact information. If you have any additional questions or need anything um, from me in regards to what this is all about, some more of the tips, tricks, whatever, your, your employee resource groups, your executive team, leadership, anything y'all need from me, this is a great way to contact me. All my contact information is there, xfuturepassion.com, chriscooperlive.com. Um, I'm at Chris Cooper Live on every IG, Facebook, Twitter, and you can find me on LinkedIn, just at Christopher J. Cooper. Um, so having said that, I want to I wanna, I wanna close this out once again. Like I said, as we celebrate and prepare to go to NOLA, I, I want you to understand, once again, to save the date, August 11th to the 13th, 2022, IABA annual meeting. It is going to be off the easy. <laughs> but I do want to take this time right now to thank some very important and extraordinary individuals that are responsible for this amazing virtual experience. As you know, it takes a lot to pull off a meeting of this magnitude with so many hundreds and thousands of individuals from all across the world um, tuning in. So I want to definitely acknowledge um, Miss Nicole Harrington, she's gonna kill me, but I wanna thank her from the bottom of our hearts for doing all of the logistics and planning and, and putting together this whole concept of this express session with the general sessions and bringing together these powerful information that's focused on leadership development and really serving us at a high level. So y'all go ahead, I'm gonna give her a big clap as well um, for all of the hard work. I know she's not gonna turn her camera on uh, because I know Nicole very well, uh, but I want you guys to definitely celebrate and thank her for all she does. Um, and, and, and I love that. Nicole is absolutely amazing. You're right, Kate. Um, I definitely wanna send a shout out once again to Kate Weaver, of course, our executive director who is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, she is also the glue that keeps all this stuff going. Hey, Nicole came on the camera. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Nicole, we, we are grateful for you. We thank you. Kate needs to come on too. So she, I know she's trying to hide, but it's okay. Uh, but I wanted to just definitely thank you on behalf of the entire International Association of Black Actuaries, uh, both of you for your leadership, for your commitment, for putting this amazing um, session together. Kate is, oh, there's Kate. Hey, Kate. Um, it has been amazing. I hope that everybody got a lot out of this session, um, out of the entire, you know, experience. I want to give a shout out, of course, to the entire executive board, the president, everybody all the way down from Dwayne all the way down um, for all the individuals that are working hard um, in front and behind the scenes um, to put some awesome and incredible things together. And as always, it has been, I'm going to take this thing off because I know you're looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> but I want to, to say that it is always a privilege um, to serve each and every one of you guys. I'm so grateful um, for your leadership. I'm so grateful for the invitation to come back year after year. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys in NOLA. Uh, like I said, laissez le bon temps roule and who that and all that. That means let the good times roll, Nicole. That's what that means. <laughs> and um, I'm so excited. Like I said, I'm honored to be of service. And, um, and everyone, like I said, keep in contact. We may be disconnected, quote unquote, physically, but it doesn't mean that we have to be 
um, not in relationship and not really connected. Um, so I love you all. God bless everybody. Have a fantastic rest of your summer. Um, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Stay tuned. Uh, once again, all the sessions will be uh, that are recorded. They're all going to be posted um, on the uh, on the YouTube page. Um, Kate's going to send an email out that's going to have all the information, all that access information. I want to thank every single speaker um, that we've had from our actuarial market trends. Um, you know, the, the representatives from D.W. Simpson, um, Galecki, Oliver James, Mr. George Nichols, um, of course, our panelists um, from yesterday, uh, Mr. Art Randolph, Sharon Robinson, Erica Scher, Stafford Thompson, um, Negete Mina <laughs> um, from today, um, and of course, all of our corporate partners and CAC and all these other types of people um, that were pivotal um, in bringing this experience um, together. So, Kate or Nicole, anything you guys need to say? They, I, I get, I got the, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> so having said that guys, I love you all. I look forward to seeing you in NOLA next year. God bless everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks so much for joining.